Welcome to Scopio Bible Fellowship. Our desire is getting God's point of view. Uh, we're continuing our, our Together in Christ number two. We're continuing on point one, built together in the Christ. And so we Jews and Gentiles were built together in Christ, and we looked at the, that portion in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 and 21. And so we're still in this. Uh, there's a lot of information here. And we're going to actually go another week on this uh, material on point number one. So we are um, on page three in our notes. We pause for prayer. Heavenly Father, our objective is to see it, your truth and apply the, this truth. Help us, Father, to apply it correctly by the working of the Holy Spirit allowing the fruit of the Spirit to be displayed in our lives, not our human efforts, not our uh, sin nature to contaminating uh, your grace work. Thank you, Father, for this uh, time of study. I encourage each heart with your word in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Uh, Point D, in whom the whole building being fit together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. So this building, uh, we're going to look at some of the terminology here today. It's covering the same material, but looking at it in more, more depth. Uh, this is in, found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21. Why bring up a building? Why does the Apostle Paul bother to do that? Why does he use the, the illustrations that he does? And if we look at the background of the situation, uh, it becomes quite apparent. Uh, the Let's turn to, uh, oh, well, let's read this first of all. Uh, the Greeks, and they called this goddess that was the goddess of their uh, worship center, Artemis, and the Romans called the same goddess Diana. Uh, it's quite complicated uh, because there would be different aspects of the goddess that would be worshipped in one community versus another. And uh, that's not important for us to know. Uh, so if you would so to go and look it up online, you're going to find a lot of different information. I'm just trying to simplify this thing here. Um and they were using this in the Ephesus, worshiping their goddess in the temple of Artemis. The saved Greeks and Romans were replacing her theology and their thinking with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what's going on here. He's using uh, things that they would have uh, in their worship. They had a the a temple built in Ephesus was known throughout the Roman Empire. It was famous. It was considered a uh, special. And so it was a house for the goddess. And there would be um, those that were uh, involved in the worship process they would have quarters there built into the temple. And so he uses that same principle of a house being a temple 
in his explanation concerning the church and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 19, verse 24. And let's go to the New King James. Book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of, of Diana brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Wherever you see and hear that not only at a Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands. Verse 27. So not only is this trade is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana. Diana may be despised and her magnificent dis magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Arcus, Macedonians, Paul's traveling companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him for some of the officials, then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried out, out uh, cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander motioned with his hands and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. So that's quite a response there. Two hours straight, there's repeating this thing. Uh, and so you understand the, the situation that the Apostle Paul finds himself in. And he has been ministering in uh, Ephesus area for over two years. And he's stuck to his guns and exposed the air and uh, presented the gospel accurately. Uh, well, let's go a bit on a little longer here. And, and when the city clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of Ephesus is a temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image that which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples 
nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there is proconsuls. Let them bring a charge against one another. So they simmer this situation down by, and they had then been uh, disquieted down in the process of time here. But it gives you a little picture there of what Paul was up against and why he chose to use the house illustration that uh, was used in the worship of the goddess Diana. All right, let's pick up our notes now. Uh, in whom? In the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a building, which is a holy temple. Read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Uh, I, this line, for, for someone just doing this new uh, this would be probably good for us to go through. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. Ephesians Ephesians two eighteen and through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So this is the link that is is being spoken of. The link is we are accessing by the Holy Spirit to the Father. God wants the, the body of Christ connected to the Father. Verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, speaking to the Gentiles, but fellow citizens with the saints, and he emphasizes saints, and members of the household of God. Now, you're not only are they, are they um, saints, they're members of the household, two titles given to them. Verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fit together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. And that's as, as far as we'll go today. Okay, back to our notes. Small letter B, the whole building. To avoid any confusion, Paul limits his attention to this, whole building as the mystical body of Christ, the church. A single building, a single truth. Small letter C, being fit together. Soon arm to join closely together 
Paul focuses on how this whole building, the body, is being fit together. The Lord Jesus Christ has provided the whole building to be closely joined together. This idea of unity is expressed by Paul in this epistle. If you look at other places with similar language, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints, connecting saints again, what is the width and length and depth and height. This may be referring to the building because that is the argument that he has been setting forth in chapter 2. And this is continuing on in chapter 3. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So this is connecting to the Father again, the same idea of connecting to the Father, this relationship that the body of Christ has with the Father. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. So he expands his previous statement in Ephesians chapter 2 about apostles and prophets and talks about all the communication gifts. And their purpose is for the equipping, the completely furnishing of the saints for the work of the edification that's the word building again. You didn't know that probably. It's the same word. It means a structure a built up of the body of the Christ. So we could put the word house there. Or the house of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying, the building of the body of the Christ. Notice the emphasis on holiness by the use of the word saints, which he mentioned in chapter two, that they were saints. He emphasizes the same concept. The next two verses now, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. And how long is this process to be going on till we all come to the unity of the faith? There was the emphasizing, well, what is the, the unity about? What, what are we unified on? It's what we believe. Our belief system needs to be on the same page till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the of experiential knowledge of the Son of God to a complete man, a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We had the fullness of God mentioned earlier. Now he talks about it specifically, which person that is being emphasized is the fullness of the, of the Christ. Why? That we should no longer be children, uh, Napios, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine 
by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And that's what they got saved out of. And he wants to make sure, that's what God's point of view is, he wants to make sure we're clean internally in our faith, the unity of conviction. Next two verses, Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verses 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love, not tossed to and fro, not carried about with every wind of doctrine, not succumbing to trickery of men, not overcome by the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth, you're focusing on the truth that you're united upon, the unity of the faith. Speaking the truth in love, proper motivation. What's the difference between legalism and not being a legalist? Your motive. If you're doing by walking in the spirit, it's correct. It's grace teaching. It's grace application. So we can have a, a challenge in the word of God for a directive for us to do something. But we have to do it the right way. Otherwise, we end up with legalism. If we're just doing it because it's the right thing, it has to be something that is a, based on my convictions um, and my, of my experiential knowledge with the Son of God. And I'm in, I'm a, and I'm in the midst of a process of perfection, of completion being complete, my growing in grace and knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as Peter put it in 2 Peter 3.18, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Christ. That's the goal, not legalism, not going back to the Old Testament procedure of the law. Verse 16, but speaking the truth in Christ, the truth in love may grow up in all things into him. So everything I do is going to be focusing on my person being in the body of Christ. And Jesus Christ is my head into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, and there we come up with that same word that we, we saw earlier, suna, amr legeo, to join closely together, joined and knit together, joined closely together, by what every joint supplies. So he said, uh, we have to have a reflection of this attitude in not in your own, not only in your personal life, but the believer next to you in the assembly. This is what God's plan is, that a whole congregation of people are on the same page in their growth and development. It may be different areas of growth, but you're all focusing on growing. You're a joint in the body, and you are supplying your part in the growth and development of Schofield Bible Fellowship. 
by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share. And what does this cause? What's the effect? It causes growth. This is the only way you grow in a local assembly is grow spiritually. That's what's effective with God. Now there is a numerical things. The, the, the world system has ideologies and principles uh, uh, using different techniques, selling trinkets, um, whatever, to get the job done of unity. But we're not called to that. We're called to be knit together by what every joint supplies, each believer contributing in their walk of spiritual growth, causing the growth of the body for the edifying. And there's that house again, the structure of itself in love. The house of love. Page four. Small letter D grows into a holy temple. What this building grows into is a holy temple. The word temple is nas, the inner sanctuary, not hieros, the temple with its porches and outer buildings. This is where the focus is. And, it, and if you would think of uh, the holiest of holies, all right, being holy, that would be that place where God is meeting man in the holiest of holies. So we're having it. So it's talking about that kind of fellowship, that kind of intimacy. The emphasis upon the presence of God in Christ, in the Father, is where God would have us grow. Our growth is having this relationship with the Father and the Son, as John puts it in 1 John, that fellowship, that, that, that camaraderie, that only... Uh, having a relationship with God can provide. So let us review the con the context which provides us with key words. In verse 19, the first one is household. And it comes from the, the, uh, the word which means belonging to a household. Vines Expository Dictionary. The subject described is one household, one belonging to a house. It's only this connection that God is interested in, not something else we bring up, what Schofield Bible Fellowship is. That's what God determines Schofield Bible Fellowship is. The context is emphasizing one new man. Verse 15, the results of Jews and Gentiles placed together equally in one body. Verse 16, in the body of the Christ. Our second word is foundation. 
this one house has one foundation and this foundation only. Verse 20, belonging to a substructure, Vine and Strong's Concordance Dictionaries, belonging to a substructure, the household has one belonging foundational substructure to support it. Not two, not three, not 20, one. The stones of the foundation are the New Testament apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ. The Old Testament spiritual leadership is not involved. Which brings us to number three, chief cornerstone. And you notice that the word stone there is in italics. That means it's not in the translation. It is put in by the translator. And it actually should read chief corner. The primary corner Strong puts it the extreme corner. This is the corner that is the best in the making of this foundation for this house. That needs this to be at this level to provide security of a substructure supporting the body, the body of Christ. The first stone laid in this foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief corner. The other stones in the foundation apostles and prophets are level with the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief corner. Number four, whole building, verse 21. Pasa, the whole. Oikidomas, nobion. No no me, excuse me, structure. House, the whole house, again. Paul again emphasizes that he is writing about one building. Number five, holy temple, verse 21. The saints in verse 19 of this temple are holy, verse 21. And both words are the Greek word hagios, set apart for a particular purpose. The saints operating saintly by the power of the Holy Spirit causes the building to be one with the Son and the Father, holy. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. You're a saint too. In other words, so the Gentiles were saints and the Jewish believers were saints. And they were both members of the household of God. One building. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21. In whom the whole building 
being fit together grows and it, this is what the change that he wants to have made at the church at Ephesus, which is what Paul was presenting to, for every church that he founded, was the objective of growing into, that's a change, into a holy temple in the Lord. You don't start out that way. You might have it in your position, that's fine, that's wonderful, but he's talking about practice here. That you might become different, growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Letter E. In the Lord, emphasizing again the relationship. Again, this is all about our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. This emphasis is pointing to the head of the church being Lord over the church. So it's not just doing what the head wants, but doing it with the right motive. It's something that, as we've looked in the past verses, we would just flip back to uh, page three again. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, the emphasis on motive there, but speaking the truth with what motive? Love, the love of God, may grow up into in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together, to join closely together. So believers are meant to fellowship with one another. If we are not willing to fellowship with one another, we're stopping this process of growth. We will have differences. But the Lord wants to be the solution to our differences. There are things that we misunderstand or we don't get the full impact of it. And God wants to teach you. We have to be open to growth. Making ourselves available to grow in grace and knowledge, to go through this process, no matter what it costs. To join closely together by what every joint supplies, each one contributes something, and God wants to, you to be a contributor each and every one of you. And if you're not willing, I didn't say you're lording over somebody, though there's only one Lord. But you have to be open to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit to grow in grace and knowledge. Every part does its share, causing growth of the body for the building of itself in love with that motivation. Back to page four. 
We have one more portion to look at. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. And we'll, we'll, uh, let's go to verse 19. We'll expand this a little bit. You can put that in your notes here too. Go 19 to 25. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest, That could be compared to what we were looking in our context as the inner sanctuary, a holy temple in the Lord. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 21. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. We're supposed to be united in faith, right? Having our hearts sprinkled dealing with their motives now from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession, the hope, the confession of expectation without wavering. Why? Because he who promised is faithful and let us consider one another in order to stir up what kind of motivation? Love. And then the results of that proper motivation is good works. And then verse 25. with the proper motive and the proper then resulting deeds of that motive, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Many churches emphasize, emphasize this point of going to church. But unfortunately, many of them for the wrong reason. Going to church is good if it's done with the right motivation. not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some. There were situations that caused them to not assemble. There was pressure, circumstances that affected them. There's, those, there's, there's circumstances, pressures that we have gone through 
as an assembly, and there are people that are not here today, for whatever pressure that was, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for ourselves. Why are we coming to School Food Bible Fellowship? And what's the future that the Father has for us? How can we get and uh, past COVID mentally and get back to filling that building with people that are motivated correctly, growing, helping people to, to grow, working together to grow, growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. And when the we're uh, uh, see the day approaching as well. The end times. And what, what's interesting when he calls this thing, this is a sin. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer rem remains a sacrifice for sins. but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, all because you have a wrong motive. God's playing hardball. He's not playing around. So I just encourage each of us to be using the throne of grace to pray for one another. That are we busy about our father's business mentally? Are we looking at how we can welcome other people coming into our assembly the problems we face. Okay, we have people coming in with kids. Do we have a place for kids? We used to have that. COVID took that away from us. What's the Father's will? If it's the Father's will, then God has a solution for the problem. And we could be united in praying and saying, Lord, okay, uh, we want to be proactive. We want to be the building that you want a holy temple in the Lord, submitting to what you have for us. And the solutions may not be easy. They may seem, may seem impossible, but that's what we go to the Lord for. He deals in the realm of the impossible. So pray for one another. What God would you have us to be? Every day. 
open doors for us. Claim, help us to claim opportunities to share the good news, to look for each of us contributing, each one doing his share. That's the only way you're going to get growth when we're all doing what God would have us to do. Should we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your provision of salvation from the lake of fire. For your salvation from the domination of the sin nature, the world system, satanic attack, and we can be strong in the Lord and the power of your might. And we can put on the armor as needed. You can provide us access to solutions. We just pray that we would um, truly be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith our convictions so that we can be united with the, around the, the right convictions that you want us focused on. Thank you so much for loving us and giving us your word in Jesus' precious name. Amen.